A lot of people have been asking me, what is the hardest ingredient for you to find? Is it flamingo tongue? Or white whorehound, maybe? And yes, those are hard to track down, but at least they exist. Now, I've got to go with that lost and possibly extinct herb, Silphium from ancient Rome. So today we're making a sauce for fried fish from ancient Rome, which calls for this mysterious ingredient. So thank you to Noom for sponsoring this video as we pick through the murky past of Silphium, this time on Tasting History. So I was picking through the Apicius Terra Coconaria looking for a recipe that uses Silphium for today's episode, and there are lots that use Silphium. He even has one that's just a Silphium sauce, but I decided on either a fried fish sauce or the womb of a sterile sow. Then it turned out that all the sows that I know are rather virile, so it's the fish sauce. Sauce with herbs for fried fish. Whatever fish you like, clean, salt, fry. Pound pepper, cumin, coriander seed, silphium root, oregano, rue, pound. Moisten with vinegar, add dates, honey, defrutum, oil, liquamen. Pour into a pot, let it boil. When heated, pour over the fried fish. Sprinkle pepper and serve. Now the author doesn't give us any quantities for the ingredients, so what I'm making today, my interpretation, far from the gospel truth, if you want to change it up, go right ahead. Now the amount that I'm making today, though, is good for about two fried fish. So what you'll need is a whole fish or filet, salt for seasoning. Now usually the Romans use liquamen or garum for seasoning, and they do mention that in this sauce, but they also say to salt the fish. So I'm just going to use regular salt. Though actually, I got a really cool fancy salt that was given to me, so if you have any of those cool fancy salts that you can never actually find a use for, go ahead and use it for this. One half teaspoon black peppercorns, one half teaspoon cumin seeds, one half teaspoon coriander seed, one half teaspoon silphium. But wait, you just said that it was extinct, or at least we don't know what it was, and that is true. So you can either leave it out completely, that's okay, some historians would say to do that, but some historians would also say swap it out for something called asafetida, or hing, and that's because it sometimes may have been used in Rome as a substitute, but we will get into that later. For my part, I'm using the asafetida because the flavor is very interesting. One teaspoon fresh oregano. If you can only find dried oregano, use half a teaspoon. One half teaspoon dried roux. Now this is a really interesting ingredient, one, because it's almost impossible to find, at least here in America, uh, that's not dried. Now if you can find it, if you're growing it in your garden, go ahead and use the fresh, because that's probably what they would have used, but uh, double it, so use a full teaspoon. Um, but if you're using the dried, than a half a teaspoon. Now, we don't know, did they use just the leaves or did they use the berries? Not sure, both are edible. Very different flavors. We think, though, that they were probably using the leaves in something like this, so they're kind of bitter. So you could swap out with any kind of bitter herb, but another thing to watch out for is if you're pregnant, you shouldn't be eating it, which is weird. Three tablespoons red or white wine vinegar, three dates, minced, two tablespoons of honey, one tablespoon of defrutum. Now here's another ingredient that you might not have heard of. Defrutum was a, a, a reduction of must. So must is the fresh squeezed juice of grapes, which includes the seeds and the skins and everything, and then it's reduced by about half to become like this nice sweet uh, syrup. The modern version is called mostocotto or vincotto, and it's very, very similar, probably. We don't know for sure. Uh, and I'll put a link in the description to where you can get that, but you can also just take some grape juice and reduce it yourself. It won't have the, the other parts of the grape, um, it's just the juice, but you can reduce it yourself. It'll be similar. What you don't want to add is any lead, which probably would have been included in the original recipe, but don't add that. Two tablespoons of olive oil, plus more for frying, and one tablespoon of liquamen, or garum. Again, you're probably not going to be able to find garum, uh, so go ahead and use colatura di alici, which is what I use, I'll link in the description, or any other kind of uh, wonderful fish sauce. Uh, Eastern Asia has a lot that you can get at pretty much any store. So before I get started cooking, I wanted to mention the sponsor of this video, Noom. So last spring to now, uh, from when I started the channel until now, uh, I'm I may have put on a few pounds. My eating habits have 
changed and not for the better. Not actually because of the food, but because I'm home all the time, as so many of us are, uh, doing research. So actually, maybe it's the history that's made me fat. Anyway, that's why I'm super excited to actually get to try Noom, because Noom uses psychology to help change your habits. Uh, and that would include your eating habits to live a healthier lifestyle and maybe lose some weight. Plus, you get paired with a real-life coach and goal specialist who can help you on your journey. So actually, just before I started filming this episode, I went on to Noom.com and took my online evaluation, and I'm starting my personalized program this week. So if you want to try it with me, just click the link in the description so you can take your own online Noom evaluation. Now let's get to cooking. So first, make your sauce. Go ahead and chop up your herbs nice and fine, then add your pepper, cumin, and coriander into a mortar, and grind everything up. Once it's ground, add the asafoetida if you're going to use it, along with the oregano and the roux. Then mix everything together, pounding the ingredients into submission. Then transfer all of that into a small saucepan and add the vinegar, the honey, the defrutum, the oil, and the garum, and the dates. Mix everything together, and then set it aside while you prepare your fish. Now when it comes to frying fish, there are a lot of ways to do it. This is the way that I'm doing it, but it's not the only way to do it. So make sure your fish is nice and clean and pat it dry. You can take off the fins or leave them on. You're not going to eat them probably, but you actually can. Then make several slices about halfway through the meat of the fish, and then season it with the salt, making sure to get some into those openings. So here's the question. Do we flour this fish, or do we not flour this fish? I am not flouring this fish. It doesn't mention it in the recipe, so we don't actually know. They might have put some sort of flour on there. I don't know. But you don't need flour to fry a fish. You just have to have a little bit more oil. And when you put it in, don't move it. Just leave it alone until it's cooked on that side. If you are going to flour it, then you can use a little bit less oil, uh, but you do need to kind of move it around for the first few seconds until it gets a nice crust so it doesn't stick to the pan. Either way, you do it, pour your olive oil into a pan, and heat it on medium-high heat until it's nice and hot, about 400 degrees Fahrenheit or 205 degrees Celsius. Once it hits that temperature, turn it down to medium and put the fish in, very gently, away from you. Again, do not move this fish. It will break up if you're not flouring the fish. Just go ahead and leave it untouched in the oil to fry for about four or five minutes while we talk sylphium. We find it stated by the most trustworthy among the Greek writers that this plant first made its appearance in the vicinity of the gardens of the Hesperides and the greater Syrtis, immediately after the earth had been soaked by a rain black as pitch. This took place seven years before the foundation of the city of Cyrene, and in the year of Rome, 143. That was Pliny the Elder, so you know it's got to be true. I mean, what's hard to believe, right? 143 years after the foundation of Rome, some sort of black rain came down around the area of, like, Benghazi, Libya, and all of a sudden, Silphium just magically sprouted out of the ground. What's hard to believe? I also love that he makes sure to mention that this story came from the most trusted of Greek writers, who was probably Theophrastus, because he's like, you know, don't, don't take it from me, it's not my word, it's, it's that guy, so if you got a problem with the story, take it up with him. Anyway, it wasn't long after the Sophium came magically sprouting up that the people of Cyrene settled the area, supposedly on the good advice of the god Apollo. Thanks, Apollo. Anytime. The plant ended up becoming one of their main exports to Greece, Rome, and Egypt, and even became their national symbol, appearing on their coins as far back as the 6th century BC. So now while the plant itself, Silphium, was very precious, Pliny says that it was the sap, or the juice, that came from the stalk and the roots, which he called laser, or laserpicium, which was really, really precious. He said that it was actually sold for its weight in silver. Which is why the dictator Caesar, at the beginning of the Civil War, took from out of the public treasury, besides gold and silver, no less than 1,500 pounds of Lazarpicium. But Pliny claims that the farmers of Cyrene allowed their sheep to graze on the Silphium, so that, within the memory of the present generation, a single stalk is all that has ever been found there, and that it was sent as a curiosity to the Emperor Nero. There had been no other Lazar imported into this country, but that produced in either Persis, Medea, or Armenia, which is grown in considerable abundance, though much inferior to that of Cyrenaica. And even that is adulterated with gum, sacopanium, or pounded beans. 
Okay, so you don't get to blame the poor sheep when you just said that Julius Caesar had 1,500 pounds of this stuff. That's not really fair, is it? Also, just for a little context, those three places that he mentioned, Persis, Medea, and Armenia, were under the control of the Parthian Empire, which we discussed at length in our episode on Parthian chicken. And that's why a lot of historians think that it's possible that this knockoff Silphium, sometimes cut with pounded beans, I guess, was Asifetida, or Hing, because that was growing in those regions at the time, probably. I guess it'd be kind of like if the recipe for Coca-Cola just completely disappeared, and all that we were left with was Pepsi cut with RC Cola. It'd be very, very sad. So Theophrastus, father of botany and that most trustworthy Greek that Pliny mentioned, discusses how Silphium was only grown in one strip along the North African coast about 125 miles long. He also says that Silphium couldn't be cultivated. Uh, it had to grow wild, and there were attempts to cultivate it, but the, the product was inferior and it just never really worked. So after the Romans took over the area, they blew through the entire supply in just over a century. But why? What was so special about this plant? We don't really know, but definitely one reason, and probably the main reason, was it was tasty, or at least they thought so. I mean, even hundreds of years after the plant supposedly went extinct, it's still showing up in recipes like the one that we're making today. There's a great scene in the Greek comedy The Birds by Aristophanes, where the main character, a mortal from Athens, is cooking when Poseidon, Hercules, and another god come walking through the door. The grater for the cheese. Can someone get it? And bring the Silphium. Hand me the cheese. Now, fire up the coals. Greetings, mortal. We three are gods and urge you to greet us. Mm, but I'm grating Silphium right now. I love that. I mean, who has time for the gods when you're eating Silphium? That's how good this stuff was. It'd be like me with anything that had the words molten and chocolate in it. So yeah, they thought it was tasty, and it was probably mostly used for food, and that's why we're talking about it here on Tasting History. But it also had a number of other uses. When the gut protrudes and will not remain in its place, scrape the finest and most compact Silphium into small pieces and apply as a poultice. So that was Hippocrates, father of medicine, describing how silphium could be used to treat what I'm assuming is a hernia. But it comes from a work called On Fistulae. And in the work, Hippocrates describes in the most vivid of terms every horrible malady that the human body will go through. Um, I'm not going to read them right now, but I am going to put a link in the description to where you can read it. It's really gross, but it's really interesting. Now going back to Pliny the Elder, he goes to town and names off 39 remedial uses for silphium. Lazare, a juice which distills from silphium, reckoned among the most precious gifts presented to us by nature, is made use of in numerous medicinal preparations. Employed by itself, it warms and revives persons benumbed with cold. It is given to females in wine to promote the menstrual discharge. Mixed with wax, it extracts corns on the feet after they have been first loosened with a knife. He also says that it's a diuretic and a digestive and can neutralize the venom of serpents and poisoned weapons. It's also good for gout, pleurisy, quinsy, sciatica, and epilepsy. But my favorite thing that he says is actually what it should not be used for. For my own part, I should not recommend what some authors advise, to insert a pill of lazer covered with wax in a hollow tooth for toothache being warned to the contrary by a remarkable case of a man who, after doing so, threw himself headlong from the top of a house. Besides, it is a well-known fact that if it is rubbed on the muzzle of a bull, it irritates him to an extraordinary degree. And if it is mixed with wine, it will cause serpents to burst, those reptiles being extremely fond of wine. <laughs> I just love this guy. What, what a world is he living in? <laughs> These uh, drunk snakes going around. And was, I love you. I love you plenty. Never change. Anyway, it also had several ties to carnal relations. It was thought that Silphium was actually an aphrodisiac. The seed pod was shaped like a heart and also appeared on Cyrene's coins. And some scholars have actually linked that to the heart being a symbol of love today. There's a little story about the plant's tie to Amour from Pausanias' description of Greece. 
He tells a story of the Discori, who were the twins Castor and Pollux from Greek mythology. You might know them better as Gemini the Constellation. These rascally brothers did everything together, from fighting to falling in love. And one day, they show up at the house of a Spartan named Formion and ask if they can stay. And Formion's like, yeah, of course, uh, you, you can stay. Just don't stay in this one room, um, because that was where his maiden daughter lived. Well, by the next day, this maiden and all her girlish apparel had disappeared. And in the room were found images of the Discori, a table, and Silphium upon it. Now, Silphium was an aphrodisiac, but it was also a contraceptive, so make what you will of that story. So yeah, that's Silphium. Possibly extinct, possibly still hiding in plain sight, and just lost to history and forgotten. Some people actually think that it's the Ferula tingitana, or tangier fennel. Or maybe it's Ferula communis, known as giant fennel. We don't know. And that's why the Asafetida that I'm using today is, is just a guess, and you would not be wrong to uh, leave it out completely. It's up to you. Either way, I used it, and I am ready to finish up this fish. So by now, your fish should be done on one side, and all that you gotta do is gently, very gently, flip it over. If it feels like it's stuck, then that means it's not cooked all the way, and you just gotta give it another minute, and then flip it over. Once you flip the fish, turn the heat to medium-low, and strike up another burner so you can start heating up your sauce. It should only take a few minutes to get this amount of sauce to a boil, which is why we're just starting it now as our fish finishes frying. Fish finishes frying. Fish finishes frying. It's so hard to say. I took so many takes to get that. Once the fish is fried on the other side, go ahead and set it onto a wire rack with paper towels underneath. Don't put it directly onto paper towel because then it ends up losing the crispness uh, and it kind of gets soggy on one side of the fish and nobody wants a soggy fish. Then, as the recipe says, go ahead and pour the sauce over the fish and sprinkle with pepper. I actually swapped the two, did the pepper and then the sauce. I don't think it really matters, but I just, I, I can't read. So here we are, our fried fish with sauce from ancient Rome. I'm gonna take my bite right out of the middle. Try not to get any, any bones. That's always the, it's always the scary part with whole fish. Not that it really matters, but. Mmm. Okay. It's so... It's like anything from ancient Rome, the flavors are so... so foreign. It's really sweet at the beginning. And then it's not sweet. It turns into something very savory and then salty. And it's like... It's going down the line of all of these different flavors. And there's there's this onion, which is actually probably the asafetida, that kind of spice onion flavor. Um, oh, but it's really good, and it's so crispy. I did, I did a good job frying this fish. Uh, yeah, I would suggest you make this sauce. I need some more sauce on there. The sauce is really good. Honestly, this sauce could go on anything. I just love how the flavor keeps changing along the way. It's it's so interesting. It's wonderful. Um, yeah, it's also really light, and and uh, and that's that's just that's lovely. I don't make a lot of light things here. I use a lot of butter and whatnot. Anyway, make sure to subscribe to Tasting History, and I will see you next time on Tasting History.